syphilis is worth uh, mentioning in a little bit more detail. Uh, syphilis used to be a rampant wide uh, killer, very popular, very important worldwide. Uh, it seems like we had it on the run with penicillin, and then when the AIDS epidemic came back, it, it, it came back as well. Uh, you may not ever see a case of syphilis, but it's worth to just run it down quickly. Uh, there's three types of syphilis, and a fourth, if you want to add congenital to the list, there is a primary lesion of syphilis called a chancre. It is a painless vesicle which often ulcerates a little bit. It has very little real uh, significant inflammation around it. That's the one that appears within a week or two after the mucosal exposure. So because it's a uh, sexually transmitted disease, it could be on oral, it could be genital. They all look the same in terms of the chancre, a painless vesicle, painless, remember that. That goes away. Uh, if it's untreated, uh, at some point after that, months, weeks, perhaps years, there's a variety of skin manifestations. The uh, number and types of skin manifestations are so numerous that you just can't classify them. The, uh, the journal, which for many years was the leading dermatology journal, was called the Journal of Dermatology and Syphilology because the spectrum of uh, dermatologic changes in syphilis was about the spectrum of all of the uh, dermatologic changes and uh, skin disease in general. Well, that can go on for many years uh, and then disappear and come and go. The third and final stage, uh, which doesn't get any worse, is the tertiary stage. And the tertiary stage of syphilis is characterized by granulomatous types of lesions which are called gummas. They're not called granulomas. They, they could be similar to it, but they're localized necrotic lesions. You can see them in the brain. You can see them in the bone. You can see them just about anywhere. And that's the tertiary lesion. And um, if you hear the word, I can't think of any other disease in which the word gumma is used except for syphilis. So if you hear somebody has gummas, you know what disease they're talking about. Uh, you could be born with it, and there's a variety of characteristic uh, appearances for babies that are born with syphilis as well. The most uh, common of which is what they call the saber shins, or bowing of the tibia, the bowing of the tibia uh, crest. And um, the thing I want to mention from a, a histopathologic point of view, but I'm not going to show you a picture, but often the cellular reaction to syphilis, whether it's primary or secondary, not the tertiary, but primary and secondary, is you'll see uh, collections of plasma cells as being the primary cell of reaction to these lesions rather than neutrophils or lymphocytes or macrophages. So a localized skin plasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate could very well be uh, some primary or secondary stage of syphilis. The uh, anaerobic bacteria are called that way simply because they don't need oxygen to grow. They could be gram positive, technically gram negative. Um, but in reality, most of the anaerobic uh, infections, which generate gas, and so often they're called gas gangrene, are caused by gram positive bacilli. And most of the time, it's clostridium. And specifically, most of the time, it's clostridium perfringens. So if you hear of a patient that has a uh, gas gangrene, you can probably think uh, instantly that's most likely statistically due to a gram positive bacillus or clostridium, which we mentioned before. And specifically, the most common genus and species would be clostridium perfringens. Okay, let's go into a little bit more detail now about the so-called obligate intracellular bacteria. Technically, they're bacteria, but they can't be cultured. They don't have ATP. They don't have mitochondria. But like bacteria, they could cause a wide variety of infections. The three most common obligate intracellular bacteria worldwide are chlamydia, rickettsia, and mycoplasma. These are all obligate intracellular bacteria. Uh, chlamydia uh, is a very, very uh, 
common cause of blindness. I'm not sure if it's the most common cause, but it's very worldwide. It's near the top of the list as being as causing blindness by virtue of the fact that it caused a very significant conjunctivitis. It's also a very, very common cause of urethritis uh, in women as well as in men uh, and has uh, a prevalence that's probably approaching that of uh, gonococcus in terms of being uh, a specific agent to cause urethritis. Another uh, chlamydial infection is a rare uh, venereal disease called LGV or lymphogranuloma venereum, but all of these are chlamydial infections. The uh, rickettsial obligate intracellular bacteria are the, com are, are the causative agents of Rocky, modded, Rocky Mountain spotted fever transmitted by the tick called Dermacenter andersoni, and they also are the cause of a uh, disease called typhus. The pattern of inflammation in rickettsial diseases, especially Rocky Mountain spotted fever, is primarily a, a vasculitis. And of course, the mycoplasma are an extremely important and common cause of pneumonias, uh, the uh, community acquired pneumonias. And if you took a list of all the bacteria that are causing pneumonia in the community rather than in the hospital, <coughs> mycoplasma is always in like in the top three, uh, top three or top four. Here is a very, very, very significant conjunctivitis. This is trachoma. This is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Here is an image of the vasculitis of Rocky Mountain spotted fever caused by the rickettsia prowazaki, transmitted by the tick dermacenter andersoni. And I don't think we'll say anything more about the uh, obligate intracellular bacteria as general classes of uh, infectious pathogens. I think now we'll move on to the fungi. And let's open the door to the fungi a little bit and remind you that fungal diseases, fungal infections, uh, are classified uh, both clinically on the basis of whether they infect only the skin and superficial uh, tissues, or they're called the superficial fungi, and they're also, or whether they're deep, and by deep they could mean anything, but they usually mean pulmonary. Another way to classify fungal infections is whether the organisms themselves, which are easily identified in tissues with either routine or special stains, are forming little balls called yeasts, or whether they have these little branch-like uh, structures called hyphae. So that's a two-dimensional way of classifying fungi, superficial or deep, or yeast versus molds, and the molds, are, of course, are hyphae. Um, let's, um, as long as we're making good time, let's talk about uh, Canada albicans as being the single most overwhelming common yeast infection, usually in immunocompromised hosts, often in diabetics, and usually in squamous mucosas that are non-keratinized like vagina, like esophagus, like oral cavity. If you go back to histology and look at your non-keratinized stratified squamous mucosa that's moist, that's where candida appears, both normally as well as overgrowth and infections. Another type of yeast that's very common, in this case it's deep because it's a very common cause of uh, meningitis in immunocompromised hosts, is cryptococcus. And that's very, very easily identified by uh, in the lab by putting a little bit of India ink on the spinal fluid, and they really, really stand out very nicely. Technically, any fungus which forms branches is a mold, or hyphae, as we say. And the two most common uh, types of uh, mold infections also usually an immunocompromised host as most fungi are, are aspergillus and mucor mycosis. Now, the last thing I want to say before we cut off this last clip is that like the acid fast bacilli, the pattern of cellular reaction to most fungal infections is granulomatous. 
Okay, we'll close the door there. Start with number 91. Thank you very much.